right, I say we start. <laughs> okay, so welcome everybody. It is December 1st, 2020. This is the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. If you need to know if you are in the correct place, um, I am going to go over some WebEx features for everybody. First off, you are, when you enter, you are muted and your video is off. When your case is called, I will unmute you and your camera, if you have one, will turn on. Um, and that is when you can present to the board. If you are here in opposition or in support of a case and wish to testify when that case is called, there is a feature on WebEx. Uh, you'll see it next to your name. It looks like a little hand. That's your virtual hand. If you click it, that is you raising your virtual hand. And that is how I know that you would like to testify. You can also use the chat feature and send a message saying, hey, I'd like to testify. And I'll know that way as well. If you are a call-in user, then obviously you do not have those features. What I do is after each case is called, I go through all of the call-in users and unmute them. If you would like to speak on whatever case we are on, you can say your name and then go ahead and do so. Um, if you don't want to speak, then just stay silent. You'll know that you are unmuted because you will hear two beeps. Um, uh, if you have any issues with any issues with this WebEx or with, with WebEx generally, you can send a message again in the chat. Um, I don't recommend emailing me because I'm not checking my emails as I'm paying attention to the hearing. Um, but you can call the office at 410-396-4301. Again, our office number is 410-396-4301, and we have staff there who can assist you. Um, also, as a note, if you are having technical difficulties and are unable to testify, um, the board deliberates and votes at the end of the docket, but you have 10 days to submit a motion for reconsideration um, if you are having, if you had things you would have said before the board had you not had technical difficulties. Um, and I believe that's everything on my end. Oh, if you are not speaking, um, if you could once, if so, say there's a case where there's a few people on the case. If you're not the person speaking, uh, please mute yourself to eliminate background noise. Um, and that's it for me. Could you repeat that, please? <laughs> you can check prior videos. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, James, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> All right, today. All right, here we go. Um, picking up where Miss Nadu left off, uh, the board, as she mentioned, will make a decision at the end of the docket uh, today on those matters that go forward. Uh, you may feel free to stay on the line and to hear that deliberation and the decision. Uh, otherwise, you can call the BMZ off, BMZA office tomorrow morning after 9 a.m. The number is 410-396-4301. Again, 410-396-4301. Uh, in any event, you should receive your resolution in the mail within about 30 days. Uh, until then, uh, we ask that you not uh, do any work until your resolution is actually uh, done and received, and do not do any work in Baltimore City without pulling the proper permits. Uh, to has a, uh, a host of postponed matters. Uh, some of you have raised questions. You may have gotten responses to them about some of those matters, uh, but I will um, identify those cases uh, that have now been postponed, and there is at least there will be at least two cases for which a postponement request will be made on the record. Um, so let me go ahead and call those matters. Uh, first case being postponed today, uh, case number 2020-50, 200 North Monroe Street, the applicant's Daniel Bissey, a huge ground floor at the grocery store. That matter is postponed. Uh, case number 2020-164, 1534 West Mount Royal Avenue, Nathaniel Johnson to use the premises as six dwelling units. That matter has been postponed. Uh, case number 2020-183, 51 through 5517 Bowley's Lane. Uh, the appellant is Joseph Woolman. The request is to increase to 127 dwelling units and construct a one-story accessory community building. Of that matter has been postponed. Again, 2020-183. Uh, also, case number 2020-188. 
1201 South Elwood Avenue. The appellant is Alexandra, I believe it's Mejia, to construct a two-story rear addition, new third floor with rooftop deck, access from stairway penthouse. Of that matter, has been postponed. Case number 2020-190, 2020-190, 2745 Huntington Avenue, Nicholas Shulman, to use the entire premises as restaurant with bar, outdoor dining and live entertainment. That matter has been postponed and will be set in uh, sometime in the future. Uh, also being postponed, case number 2020-191, 5107 Old Hamilton Avenue. Uh, the appellant is Nate Preddle, and that, uh, for that matter, it's a request to construct four two-story detached multifamily ten dwelling units each, total of 40 dwelling units with 40 parking spaces. For that matter, it's postponed. Uh, I guess I can do this on the record now um, with uh, Mr. Preddle. Uh, yep, yep. The case, of, uh, the, the two cases, case number 2020-189, uh, 1740 Light Street and 1742 Light Street. Uh, that matters to a request to consolidate lots, construct the three-story rear addition, rooftop deck, access from stair penthouse, and use a four dwelling unit and first floor commercial. Uh, together with case number 2020-189, I'm also calling case number 2020-195, 1 East Montgomery Street. Again, the appellant's Nate Preddle in that uh, premises is the request is to use for five dwelling units with first floor offices. Uh, there's a request for postponement uh, because that was made within 24 hours of this hearing start time. Uh, that has to be on the record. So, uh, Mr. Preddle? Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, uh, so, you're requesting a postponement on those two matters, 189 and 195. Yes, that, that's, that's correct. Um, and we're, we're, the postponement request is based, uh, we would like some more time to work out both uh, technical issues as well as practical issues, uh, particularly for Light Street. Um, we'd like some more time to deal with the Department of Planning uh, and some issues that they brought up. And the same in 195 for Montgomery, but I would also like some additional time to contact the Community Association. So I would uh, ask the board to grant these requests. Uh, very well. Um, any discussion necessary from the board? No, nope. hearing none. <laughs> uh, we'll go ahead and grant that postponement. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, sir. Uh, while we're on the subject of postponements, um, we we need to add one more uh, postponement issue. Um, we are awaiting a fourth board member. Uh, we expect that um, uh, Mr. Strachan will um, uh, be available. Uh, once the docket, the regular docket has commenced, uh, but we're not exactly sure at what time. Uh, because she won't be available at the start of the docket, we will only have three board members. Um, there is a special rule that applies or that attaches when there are only three board members. Uh, a vote to approve an application must be unanimous, so all three board members must agree. Um, for that reason, uh, we offer either party the opportunity to postpone a matter uh, given the requirement that uh, a decision be unanimous uh, for that. So to the extent there are any other parties whose case I did not call is being postponed who are seeking a postponement because of that rule, um, uh, please raise your virtual hand at this point and we can identify you and that matter and address uh, that request for postponement. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Could they postpone yes, it for 17 minutes? Or is it, is it like, <laughs> no, like, is it postponed for later today or does it have to be postponed for a whole nother day just because it's only 17 minutes? Now, you know what? I can, uh, I mean, we can address the matters in any particular order, but, um, well, first of all, uh, we expect uh, Ms. Strachan to be present probably in about a half an hour or so. She uh, said closer to 1.30. So, so we're um, what you could do is say anybody who wants to wait, like as they're being called. Sure. We could just keep, we could push them to the end of the docket. Right, right. <laughs> it's so not beautiful, to, but it'll work. I just don't want anyone to, to like... Date. 
have yeah, to wait for weeks for something they could wait 15 minutes for. Sure, you're right. So once we get to your case, if you feel compelled to move to postpone because we're still dealing with three, or you can wait and say, please skip me and go to the next case and where we are. But we expect her uh, to be uh, in attendance uh, sometime fairly soon. So um, if you just sit tight, you may not need to uh, utilize that, exercise that right to postpone. Oh. Um, bigger issue. It looks like we lost Bill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just you and me. <laughs> uh, which we uh, cannot. Oh, no, we lost him technically, not. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, I mean, if you want to call the consents, you can call the consents. Yeah, um, yeah, let me before that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, one more piece of administrative process here. Um, there are, we, we have on the docket uh, those cases uh, which are on the consent docket. We place them on the consent docket when the board believes it has sufficient information to approve uh, the request or the appeal. And there are a few of those on this docket today. Let me call those matters. Uh, case number 2020-181. 1825 North Bond Street, Keyshawn Rucker, uh, request to construct two-story rear addition with rear deck. Uh, that matters on the consent docket. Uh, also, case number 2020-186, 1417 Clarkson Street, Matt Nofel, to construct two-story rear addition with rooftop deck. Uh, and maybe it. Those two cases are on the consent docket. Uh, let me uh, address uh, Mr. Rucker first. 2020-181-1825 North Bond Street. Uh, Mr. Rucker to construct two-story rear addition with rear deck. Uh, I see Mr. Uh, Rucker uh, on my screen, at least his name. Uh, do we have any uh, staff reports or planning reports? Nothing from staff. Martin French from the Baltimore City Planning Department. Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. French. Uh, Mr. Rucker, can you hear me? Yes, I'm Ms. Rucker. How are you doing? I'm sorry. Apologies. Ms. Rucker, okay. uh, is there anything uh, you'd like to add to your application at this time? Um, no, I think I provided everything um, to the office. I think basically I have. Um, you guys were closed, so I was a little ignorant to the process um, when I was building or constructing the home. I actually have a buyer that's in contract that's waiting to purchase the home. So I've just been waiting to come before you guys for the appeal. Okay. Well, you're here now, and I think we can move it forward. Uh, if there's nothing further uh, to add your application, um, The board having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. And that will conclude you. your case. <laughs> Thank right, you. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you guys. Thanks. All right. Have a great day. You too. Uh, Mr. Nopal, uh, case number 2020-186, 1417 Clarkson Street. Uh, this is a request to construct two-story rear addition with rooftop deck. Do we have any staff and or planning reports? Uh, nothing from staff. Planning department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Uh, very well. Uh, Mr. Nopal, uh, is there anything you'd like to add to your application at this time, sir? Uh, no, there's not. Very well. Uh, the board, having heard your appeal, we believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. Okay. Uh, and now we will fill back. Technically, and in, in every other way, right, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> um, we will uh, commence with the uh, regular docket and call the first matter, which is case number 2020 71, 841 East Chase Street. Uh, the appellant is Donnie Ankry, and this is a request to construct third floor rear addition and increase from three dwelling units to four dwelling units. And I'll ask for any staff and or planning reports. Uh, there is one letter in opposition, 
Um, it says, my name is Regina Hammond. In my capacity as the president of the Rebuild Johnson Square Neighborhood Organization, I'm writing to oppose the application requesting relief to construct a third floor addition to add a fourth dwelling unit to the 841 East, to 841 East Chase Street. The reasons for the community's opposition are as follows. The property is a row house that was originally a single family home. It was later converted to a three unit building. The property currently has no off street parking to serve the existing three units and no new parking is proposed. The existing 1600 square foot lot does not provide enough area to support a fourth unit. A 39% variance of the lot area requirements would be required for the proposed fourth unit. That amount of variance seems excessive. It appears the owner may have begun constructing the addition without first obtaining zoning approval. The owner has not contacted me or anyone from the association about development plans. Adding density to this part of the neighborhood is not supported by the Johnston Square Master Plan approved by the Planning Commission in March 2020. Thank you for your consideration. Okay. Planning Department reviewed this application, uh, noted this property is in the Johnston Square Urban Renewal Area. That particular urban renewal plan does not prevent the proposed use. However, the department wishes to caution the applicant that this property is still listed in the plans Appendix A as a property for acquisition and disposition for rehabilitation. And the applicant should contact the Department of Housing and Community Development to discuss removing it from the list if that in any way would interfere with the financing of the proposed use. As mentioned in the letter from the uh, commenter Previously, this particular property has a 1,600 square foot lot area. The requirement for four dwelling units would be 2,625 square feet. The amount of variance required for that would be 39%. The department notes further that the use of the property for three dwelling units uh, would still require a variance, uh, in this case of about 15%, and that is, according to the application, one of the previous uses of the property. Uh, <clears throat> there would be no increase in the lot coverage as the proposal is to build the addition above the existing uh, building in the, in the rear of the property. Uh, another thing that is uh, worth mentioning, if this property was undergoing conversion, uh, as mentioned in the zoning code in an R7 or an R8 zoning district, which would of course require a legislative authorization, which is not the case here, this particular property would also require 33% variance of the floor area requirement uh, in order to have the fourth dwelling unit added to this. Uh, for these reasons, the department is recommending disapproval of the application unless the applicant can demonstrate a practical difficulty or unnecessary hardship associated with continuing to use this property as a multifamily dwelling containing three dwelling units. The department would have no objection to approval of use of the property as a multifamily dwelling containing three dwelling units. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. French. Um, um, the applicant is on the line. It looks like he, he's unmuted. I don't believe he has a video. And then we have some uh, Regina Hammond, who you'll see here as a panelist, is here in opposition. She wrote the letter. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ankry. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you? Doing well, sir. So, Tell us about your matter. Sorry, what did you say? Tell us about your case. Yeah, so my client who owns the property um, wants to wants to add a fourth unit. There's currently three units there per, um, and right now the fourth floor, I'm sorry, the third floor already has a portion of the building that's, there's already a unit up on that third floor. So we're not proposing to make the building any taller than what it is now. It's, you know, sort of just kind of um, continuing what's already um, continuing that upper level uh, piece. So we don't feel like from a massing perspective, it's going to kind of take away from the neighborhood. Um, I, now parking, you know, I, I know there's an issue about the parking. There is no on-site parking. Um, so I think they were going to rely on, um, you know, uh, on street or um, off street, you know, parking within the neighborhood, similar to other properties. And, um, and then there are some other things that were mentioned by the board members about the um, getting special permission or something for the fourth unit for the percentage. I'm not actually fully aware of what that means. So um, if there's anything that we can do to, to address that, let me know. And regarding the neighborhood, 
um, the community board. I, I the client I guess didn't inform me that there was a a board um, or a community association to to speak to. But if there's a contact there, we're happy to reach out to them and work it out. Uh, can you tell me about the status of the proposed fourth dwelling unit? Has that already been constructed or partially constructed? So I I, I can't speak. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it shouldn't be. Um, True. But I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know what the owner does. You know, I'm not there on site, but I can definitely check and find out. Yeah. Um, are you are you the owner? I'm I'm the architect. Oh. Yeah, I don't think the owner. I I sent him the Zoom link, but I don't think he's on. He's on the call. Um, what's the property owner's name? I can see if I can find him on the list. Um, well, I, I know his last name is Erman, E-H-R-M-A-N. I'm going to text him now. If he's not on the call, then I'll have to just follow up to get answers to whatever questions we need. And yeah, I don't see him. Okay, no problem. Um, the board like to move to opposition? Yeah, let's do that. If uh, there's no more information on the uh, on the uh, application, uh, Ms. Hammond. Yes. Good afternoon. Um, good just afternoon. on behalf of um, the Johnston Square community, um, we would just uh, like to say for the record that the community shares the concerns raised by the Department of Planning staff report, especially regarding the parking and the density, as well as for the reasons set out in the letter dated today in opposition, the community asks that this request be Oops. She cut off? Yeah, it looks like we might have lost her. Hold on. Hammond, are you still there? I'm, I'm still here. Sorry, your phone cut out. Oh. No, I'm still here. Uh, Ms. Hammond, can you tell us about the, uh, maybe a little more about the parking situation uh, <coughs> based on what we've heard from, I guess, both the applicant's uh, representative. Uh, there is no, he's relying on on street parking. Uh, what's the, is that reasonable uh, with the four dwelling unit? That is the chance. Parking all is a challenge, not just in that location, but the entire community. And the density is also an issue. And based on our master plan, there is design that uh, we're not trying to have people on top of each other as we go through developing this neighborhood, redeveloping the neighborhood and rebuilding it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions of uh, Ms. Hammond from, from the board? Oh. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hammond. I appreciate your input. Uh, we will um, go back to, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Ankery. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, question for you is uh, why four units, if you know, I know you're not the owner, but why four units as opposed to the three uh, that exist, which in and of itself requires a variance? Um, I think you were just looking for opportunity to, you know, to, to, to bring in another tenant. Um, you know, I think he just felt that um, the fact that the upper floor is only a portion of it is higher up, he thought maybe there's opportunity there just to, you know, uh, add more space. That's, I mean, that's kind of me speaking for him and assuming that's what the answer is. Okay. Um, 
but just to, just to get a little more clarification, you were saying that the three units requires a, a variance. I, I, I was planning. Planning. what? Well, the, the space that normally you would allot in uh, for three dwelling units, I think uh, the property doesn't even have that. Although we know that it's been used and appropriately used as you know three dwelling units. So, mm -hmm. and now I guess I should retract that. You wouldn't need a variance to continue to use it as three dwelling units, uh, but 39% is a fairly large variance that's been requested. Uh, and, and this will not be an owner-occupied property, correct? Correct. You know? mm -hmm. so, so just to make sure I'm on the same page, so the, the three units that it's currently used or zoned for, you're saying in order for it to be continuous a three unit, it has to still need to get variance approval? I don't think I don't know that that's the case. I was I was commenting on the statements from planning. Um, in terms of the allotted square footage or the standard square footage for uh, three dwelling units, I don't. I, what is this property? It's sixteen hundred square feet. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, the reason for our comment was if this had been, for example, a two dwelling unit structure and the applicant was coming to make a third dwelling unit in it it would require a 15 percent lot area variance just to put the third dwelling unit in it no we're not suggesting that a variance is required to continue to use it as three dwelling units but we're just pointing out the situation that is already over the uh, amount of lot area uh requirement that is in the zoning code currently got it um, by the way, one one thing, um, the owner texted me, he said he's on the call, he's under the name Jack, so perhaps he can, maybe we can unmute him and he can answer the question about the reason for the additional unit. Uh, yes, I will do so now. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah. What's your name, sir? Yeah, hi, I'm Jack. Jack who? Yeah, Jack Ehrman. I'm uh, okay. part of the team the the ownership for the um for the building down on chase street and basically we were very excited to come in and be a part of the development of the community to um you know help uh, revitalize um the area and uh you know basically reconstruct brand new dwelling units um to help to help uh again to help the area grow and um you know, uh, revitalize. Right. Uh, did you have a? Did you consider talking with the community association and also addressing the uh, their urban renewal plan of the Johnson Square community? So, as as was stated, we 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 had not had any contact or any communication with anybody from the um, Johnson Square urban renewal plan at all, and. Uh, we would, you know, like like Donnie said, we'd be more than happy to uh, sit down and chat and see, you know, how we can, you know, be part, be a part of it. Do you realize that the community association is against the, this proposal? Right. We we heard that, and we wanted to make it make them aware that our intention is to be able to help the community grow and. Um, you know, again, we work with local agencies in Baltimore, um, providing housing to, you know, lower income residents that are able to, you know, be able to come in and, uh, you know, receive, um, you know, jobs, employment things of that nature to be able to increase their, their, you know, their housing opportunity. And uh, the reason for the fourth unit, the fourth unit, um, again, when we purchased the building, there was a, a structure there. Um, at this time, we wanted to, uh, you know, approach the board and, um, you know, bring bring our uh, bring our intention known that we would like to have the building utilized, you know, to again to to be able to to revitalize the area. You know, the 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 additional unit. It's uh, intended as a, as a one-bedroom apartment. It's not intended as you know having you know uh, more um, you know more people than than space. It's it's really intended as as a uh, 
you know, as a focused area. What does that mean? It's a, it's intended as a as a one bedroom apartment that we're we are adding to the 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 additional unit that we are requesting for. Is a is an additional one bedroom apartment. Has construction started on it? So we no. So we have not we have not uh, constructed at the time of purchase. There was a structure there. So there is framing there, but we have not, um, we have not done work yet. We're waiting for the zoning approval to, um, you know, again, allow us to be able to construct a one bedroom apartment additional to the, um, to the other existing units. Okay. Uh, is there anything else, uh, Mr. Herman, that you'd like to add at this time? In support of your application, in light of the standard that uh, we've heard from planning, it has to be met. Right. Just understanding that our intention is to, um, yeah, this, uh, that the board under um, hears and and uh, acknowledges that we again our our intention is to, uh, again to be be a part of the revitalization of the area um, and you know that's that's what we would you know that that's what our intention is to be able to help the community um be able to revitalize okay uh thank you uh and just so um everybody knows uh, who calls in with opposition uh, what we do is we allow the applicant to uh, be heard uh, we'll hear from the opposition, but then the applicant gets the last word, uh, just like in court, um, uh, in rebuttal. And so that'll conclude uh, the hearing for matter number 2020-71. Uh, thank you all for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, let me see. Oh, <laughs> subject to any other callers. Who, uh, yeah, which so be I have been <laughs> staring in shock somewhat because there are no call-in users. <laughs> mm. So they may have lost all the postponements. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of call-in users, but they all have names and whatnot and <laughs> kind of raise hands and use features. So I don't have to do that whole unmute thing is what I'm saying. Well, oh, I do see one raised hand. Although it looks like it's for a different case. Yeah, it's for 182. Okay. Which will actually will be the next case. Yeah. So I'm going to assume that's in error or for the next case. Well, let me double check. I'm unmuting you, the person with the raised hand, to make sure that you do not want to testify on this case, 2020-71-841 East Chase Street, Donnie Angry. Hello? Sorry, I made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> Thought so. All right. Uh, that's everybody, Mr. Chair. Very well. Thank you. Uh, calling the next case on the regular docket, case number 2020-182. Uh, it is 5105 Plainfield Avenue with a description. <laughs> Plainfield Avenue, 100 feet northeast of Chessmont Avenue. Uh, the appellant, Atia Wells. This is a request to use the premises for a community managed open space farm. Okay, I'll uh, hear any planning, I'm sorry, staff or planning reports. All right, we have two letters in support for this appeal. Um, the first is from the owner of the property who states, I searched for years to find previously undeveloped land in Baltimore City to facilitate the creation of a sustainable urban educational farm. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, it looks like this is the owner. I'm making sure they're not also. Okay. My mistake. Continuing to read. All right. The vision is well underway with the hard work by Atia Wells and her extraordinary team of volunteers and community members. They've made great strides in transforming this precious land beyond my dreams. 
the wonderful opportunities in creating green space, widely available fresh food, opportunities for volunteers and ag agricultural education while connecting with nature is truly extraordinary. Um, as landowner, I'm not only allowed, I'm not only allowed, but encourage these activities. We want to see benefits for the community, children and adults who are learning and growing alongside those plants and animals they work so hard at nurturing. The next letter is from Baltimore Green Space, who writes, I'm writing to you um, as the director of Baltimore Green Space, where we work to support the care, the care and preservation of neighborhood green spaces in Baltimore. We greatly appreciate all your work to ensure that communities are developing in ways that support the greater good of Baltimore. Today, by supporting Appeal 2021-82, you have the opportunity to be part of a story of community of community change that is shifting the narrative of the neighborhood and Baltimore as a whole. The Bliss Meadows project has been making headlines since it began by miraculously gaining enough support to purchase a building for an education center and begin to grow the farm. Um, their work is already serving the community with food deliveries, education sessions, and more. They're working on this project to nurture this love of the community so Baltimore children and neighbors have a place to breathe in all that is good. I also have another letter here that states, sorry, my name is Emma Reisinger, founder of Yellow House Farm which I established in 2016 at my residence in a nearby Seedmont. I became aware of this property around 2017. Um, the land itself reminds us that the northeast corner of the city was until relative, relatively recently farmland. As a farmer, I was certainly interested in the possibility of the land, but I'm fully in support of Bliss Meadows transition to community managed open space. Um, <laughs> Um, as a farmer, I understand bringing land into cultivation takes time and investment. Rezoning this land will help provide some of that stability so that the organization can continue to build on its progress year after year. And that's it for support letters. Okay, thank you. The department has reviewed this application. This particular application, uh, just, of course, describes it. Uh, with an address which doesn't actually apply at the moment, 5105 Plainfield Avenue. The building referred to in the letter that was just read to you, as far as planning is aware, is on an adjoining property known as 5111 Plainfield Avenue, and it's not part of this application. Uh, however, mm -hmm. that said, this site is one that is shown according to its lease uh, back in 2019 as in marginal condition for agricultural use and the application proposes returning the property to productive agricultural use, including going beyond USDA organic standards for cultivation of food classified as organic produce. This community managed farm would be a place where community members could raise limited crops of herbs and other produce requiring intensive cultivation. It would also serve as an outdoor environmental education facility for children and adults interested in organic gardening and farming. In addition, it's facilities for rainwater collection and distribution and special features such as terraced farming would serve to educate visitors about the importance and usefulness of recycling and ecosystem friendly practices. For these reasons, the Department of Planning recommends approval of this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Um, Ms. Wells, good afternoon. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, tell us about your project, please. Hi. Um, wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so my name is Atiyah Wells. I'm a pediatric nurse and an outdoor educator. Um, we are applying for a conditional use for this two and a half acre lot with two ponds on it. Um, in our neighborhood, I live in the neighborhood of Frankfurt. Uh, we want to turn into community managed open space farm. We've been working with our community association and our neighbors to develop the site. And we've been asking them, our neighbors, you know, like what kind of programs they want us to run. We've been providing fresh farm fresh produce to our neighbors because we are technically in a food desert. Um, I started the whole Bliss Meadows project because I wanted a safe space within walking distance for my own two children to have a safe place to play um, and somewhere that we can walk to and to also learn about our environment, especially in urban areas because there aren't that many um, aren't that many opportunities for people who live in the city to learn about nature where they currently live. Um, we know that spending time in nature brings value to our lives, whether it be through improved health, greater connection to the natural world and or peace of mind, as well as a connection with your neighbors. Um, 
And so we are just asking for the board to grant this request to continue to cultivate the land um, and turn it into community managed green space, as well as uh, having our urban farm on site. Great. Um, let me ask you, uh, in, in the operation of this uh, urban farm, can folks from outside the community come and either purchase items? Uh, is that how it will work? Um, we are members of the Farm Alliance of Baltimore, and so what we will have, um, we basically grow produce and we deliver that to the Farm Alliance and they sell it at the farm stand at the 32nd Street Market. Um, we do intend to have a farm stand on site where folks from out the neighborhood can also come and uh, purchase produce. And we also have designated um, specific beds where our community members will be able to come into and harvest their own produce. So there'll be like a lot of you pick stations and then we have some uh, fruit trees that we will be growing so people can come and pick their own fresh fruits as well. Great. Sounds appetizing. Um, any uh, uh, questions from uh, the board from as well? No, I'm good. We have um, several raised hands. Um, let me see. I'm just going to go through them in order. Uh, Ms. Bethea? Yes, hi. I'm Bethea. Uh, my name, I'm the farm manager at Meadows, actually. I just wanted to come speak to some of the uh, activity that we have on the farm. Uh, in addition to what uh, Ms. Wells just told you, uh, we also have chickens that are uh, some fresh eggs. Uh, I've personally been uh, renovating a lot of the land. Uh, we have quite a lot of invasives that have been taken for the area. Chokeweeds, mulberries, the intention of keeping a uh, really healthy uh, as Ms. Wells also said we're going to have uh, lots of plans for community activity it is very much our intention to have educational spaces so that uh, students so that um, uh, residents can come and uh, grow their own vegetables as well as uh, in the next Hopefully, as long as we have the um, the uh, units uh, next to our property we developed, cook their own food and learn about different types of regional. <laughs> so the different foods that are to the city resident, and they can learn from local chefs how to properly prepare these things and feed themselves in a really hyper local manner. Um, uh, but before I go any further, did anyone have any specific questions about our projects uh, or our specific to the actual growing. All right, I think we're I think we're good and, and well equipped on on that uh, part, Mr. Matea. Thank you. Fantastic. Yes. All right. Next up, Maria Strauss. Yes. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, my name is Maria Strauss. I am the executive director of the Farm Alliance of Baltimore. Um, and we are a uh, 501c3 nonprofit membership organization of urban farms and gardens here in Baltimore City. Uh, Bliss Meadows is one of our core farm members. They have been a member of our organization since 2019. And I just wanted to speak to a couple of the specific things that we have witnessed um, since then about this project and why we think it would make a great community managed open space. Um, specifically, uh, we know that um, we have, Ms. Uh, Ms. Wells, who you heard speak earlier, uh, has been attending our meetings uh, with great regularity and consistency. Uh, we've witnessed her picking up trash at the site, talking to neighbors, canvassing the neighborhood to find out their desires. Uh, we've also seen her using her and her staff um, using tools and uh, equipment responsibly and in a way that comports with what we know to be best sustainable and regenerative agricultural practices. Uh, so we think this reflects that uh, she and her staff have some good training behind them. The benefits of these practices we know will be distributed to the community. Um, so it's not just about the farm fresh produce. They're also building soil that will mitigate flooding and trap both carbon and fixed nitrogen. Um, so these are both things that will help the Chesapeake Bay. 
Uh, she's also providing the community programming that she spoke about. Um, so we are prepared to continue to provide technical support, which we've been doing for the last two years through our experienced staff members, um, as well as material support and volunteer labor support for Bliss Meadows so that they can successfully complete their transition to a community managed open space and to continue to uh, beneficially steward that land. Um, and please do not hesitate to reach out to me um, if you require any more information. I'll leave my phone number with the host in the chat. Very well, thank you so much. Thank you. Next up, we have Miriam Avens. Good afternoon, Ms. Avens. Good afternoon. Um, I'm coming before you today, thank you so much, as a longtime greener here in Baltimore City. I've been involved in the greening world long enough to found a nonprofit that's doing well and now be on the Sustainability Commission, but I'm just coming with my personal hat today. Um, community managed open spaces, such as the one that Ms. Wells is building, do an enormous amount to build community, a sense of community within communities. They can be really important ways of creating um, places for people to meet up, ways to enrich sociability, and indeed, like the community garden I work with, I know several people who got jobs through the you know, being in the garden. I also just, I don't want to repeat what other people have said. I do want to note, I know that there is a neighbor who's concerned about runoff from the site, which has been a longstanding issue. And through my work um, in the greening world, I know that adding additional plants to the site in a thoughtful way is one of the more effective ways to address this longstanding issue. Thank you. Great, thank you for your input, ma'am. <laughs> And next we have, let me see, I know there's one more. Rose Brissafaro. Yes, hi, that's me. Um, I'm Dr. Victoria Rose Brissafaro. I am the Environmental Education Program Specialist for Backyard Base Camp at Bliss Meadows. Um, I think the most useful piece of information I can give you today is that um, the staff at Bliss Meadows last week, just before Thanksgiving, we did community canvassing around the neighborhood to administer a survey to find out what our community needs are. And in that survey, one of our questions was, do you support community management of your neighborhood green space? And out of, we immediately got 17 responses back and 16 out of those 17 neighbors said, yes, they do support community management of the space that we're talking about today. And the one person who did not agree said that they think we should build more houses in the area. Um, so I just wanted to, <laughs> give that information to you to let you know that we have a 94 percent approval rate by the community thank you thank you dr bruce Farrow. okay and that looks like all the hands raised if anybody else wants to testify i think by now everyone has raised their hand or sent a message so um i believe that's it for this one mr chair all right thank you um ms wells uh, do you have anything else you'd like to add at this time no, thank you everybody for your testimony and thank you um, to the members of the board for hearing us. Thank you, we appreciate your uh, presentation. Okay, that'll conclude. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, yes. you can give me one second to mute and move these before we go to the next uh, one. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Um, let me see, uh, okay. Just gonna move everybody back to attendee. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Uh, calling the next uh, case on the regular docket.
uh, matter number 2020-185, property to be known as 1202 East Truston Street, uh, which are currently maybe 14 vacant lots. The appellant is Daniel McCarthy, and uh, this is a request to consolidate the lots, construct a four-story multifamily, uh, total of 70 affordable uh, dwelling units with 30 parking spaces. I'll hear from staff uh, and planning with regard to any reports you may have. So we just received a letter in support. Um, it says, as the president of the Oliver Community Association, I'm writing in strong support of BMZA 2020-185. The Oliver community has worked with the developers of the Sojourner Place at Preston Healthcare for the Homeless and Episcopal Housing Corporation for over a year on their plans to develop a 70 unit multifamily property at 1202 East Preston Street. We have reviewed and approved the designs and the elevations of the proposed building at our monthly association meetings. This project creates a new standard for housing quality in Oliver and sets an expectation that everybody deserves good housing. The Oliver community sees this development as a positive step for our community. We have visited other collaborations of the developers and are impressed by their record of success to create high quality housing for vulnerable people. We are happy to have housing created in Oliver that can benefit the current residents of the community and we welcome these new residents. The development of the property is a significant investment in our neighborhood and we are proud to support it. Thank you. Um, that's it for our staff. All right, Mr. Lynch. Planning department has reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the Oliver Neighborhood Development Plan Urban Renewal Area. The properties, the lots that are proposed for consolidation are all vacant lots presently. However, they are also, of course, listed in the properties for acquisition and disposition for rehabilitation list in that urban renewal plan. And the department recommends that the uh, applicant contact the Department of Housing and Community Development about having those properties removed from the list uh, if it's necessary to facilitate financing of the proposed housing development. These are about a dozen lots. There is also uh, a public alley within the site. And although the uh, site plan and the original architectural floor plan show the building largely avoiding that alley, Nonetheless, in order for this proposal to move to fruition, it's going to be necessary to have that alley closed and conveyed by the city to the applicant. Uh, therefore, the department is recommending that approval of the application be subject to the condition, the consolidation of lots and alleyways is completed, and that all improvements, including landscaping, are completed in accordance with plans and designs approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Okay, uh, Mr. McCarthy, we'll hear from you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me and, and uh, considering the application here. Um, so uh, uh, I was, uh, I would like to, to thank Mr. Uh, the, the folks at the Oliver Community Association. They really said exactly what I would have said. I, um, they, they have been terrific partners on this, as as Mr. Johnson had mentioned. It's a collaboration of Episcopal Housing Corporation, where I'm the executive director, and Healthcare for the Homeless. 70 units total, 35 will be uh, people exiting homelessness, and 35 will be uh, affordable housing units. Um, uh, as, as Mr. French had noted, uh, it's, it's the consolidation of a number of lots. Um, and uh, we have been working on the closing of the alley um, with Mr. Paul Barnes of the city. Um, we have a land disposition agreement with the, the mayor and city council to acquire nine of the lots currently. And as that gets through, the, uh, the board of estimates will be able to then have all of the lots in the development and we'll be able to, to continue that and finalize that consolidation. So, um, you know, we have been working closely with the community association and uh, and taking their input into into account and we think that the building that we're going to be constructing will be uh, well received it, it's on a major thoroughfare it, it uh, at one side is on Harford Road another side is on Preston Street and then it's cut triangle a lot on uh, on Central Avenue so uh, we're thrilled to be working with uh, with the Oliver community community association um, we do have our financing lined up for this 
Um, we spent considerable amount of time with the UDARP panel and uh, taken their input into account as we've designed this building. Um, and uh, we would uh, appreciate the board support for the on this action. Very well, thank you so much, Mr. McCarthy. Um, who else do we have? Well, I have a quick question, question for Mr. McCarthy before. Sure. Yeah. If you have the lots that start at 1208, how are you allowed to call it 1202? Uh, right, so I mean, the, the, talking to the planning department, they will allow us to, uh, the, 1202 did exist at one point in, in the past, uh, and we can, because it, it did exist before, though 1202 was consolidated into what I believe is 1316 uh, Harford Road, uh, we're able to consolidate it. Uh, at, at a, any address that once existed on the in the fourteen lots that we're uh, that we're consolidating. Okay. Yep. And we wanted to use the corner, which would be the e, that will be where our front entrance is, right at uh, at twelve o two. And so anybody who was doing a GPS or some other way of guiding themselves to our uh, location would be would be most easy to find our front door. Understood. Good. Um, if anybody would like to testify on this case, it's 2021-85, known as 1202 East Preston Street. Uh, please go ahead and raise your virtual hand or send me a message stating that you would like to testify. Currently, I see, also if your hand was raised previously, you'll want to put it down now. Um, Audrey Carter, are you here to testify for this case? Yes, I am. Okay, uh, you may go ahead. Um, hello, um, board. Um, this is my um, first time ever uh, kind of testifying or being on here. Uh, so I thank all, um, all of you. Um, as uh, you said, we're talking about the property uh, on Preston and Harford Road. Um, um, I'm in opposition to uh, the, uh, the building being put there and for the reasons of um, I know it's a 70 unit for under uh, income um, people, but uh, at this point we're looking for a, a supermarket uh, because our, our local supermarket that was uh, formerly in Church Square has now closed. And um, in that particular area, even in the Oliver community, the surrounding communities are also considered a food desert. And so right now I am working with a couple of other people that we're trying to find viable space and locations to uh, see where we can try to get a supermarket in that area because uh, we don't have a supermarket in the area. Um, and while um, 70 units for under income uh, individuals are, um, is good, um, I do believe because we don't have the supermarket, um, that is just gonna more overpopulate the area or congest the area. Um, we have a high um, amount of seniors in the area, and again, they have nowhere to go for the market, so we're trying to get something back in the area. Uh, we formerly had a market on Harvey Road, which closed down, and they're not doing anything with that. And again, there was one uh, in Church Square, um, uh, which was probably about less than a mile away from where they're putting this, uh, this building, and that has now closed down. So um, there are no markets pretty much within mm -hmm. several miles. Of the place. Um, also, um, when um, areas we, we uh, me and a uh, few other people have looked into trying to get a market, and one of the factors was um, looking at the income level of the community. And while you know, again, I'm not against um, building um, for low income individuals. Um, also, looking at um, the the pop, uh, the income population may bring down the income level of the community. And again, markets may not want to invest into uh, the community based on that. Um, again, uh, because of the location, we're looking more hopefully to, maybe that could be a viable location for a market. And as uh, Mr. McCarthy said, it's on a major thoroughfare and it's in the middle of several communities and that um, that market could support. Also in that location on one of those properties is a garden. 
which was gated in. And when the, they tore down uh, the locks funeral home, it opened up the space. And, and um, so, but there was a, a garden there and that garden has been there for over five years or more. And I say that because I, um, I have uh, farmed on that garden or actually I oversee that garden. And that garden supports schools and churches and the community where we would come over. We, were, we have grown corn, herbs, tomatoes, green beans, those kind of things. Um, I brought my class over and, and just to introduce myself, I'm a teacher. Uh, I also worship in the community. Uh, my church is there. I've lived in the community and I'm about a block away from that actual location of the community. So I'm invested in there in the community for probably over a good 40, 45 years ago because I even lived on Central Avenue across the street from it. So the thing is, is that that particular garden, we, we worked on it, had youth work on it. We've had um, youth from uh, um, the YES program. They've come and harvest uh, things, cleaned it up, cleaned all along Harper Road. So uh, uh, that particular garden there also, they're, they're looking at um, taking that to, to be a part of their project. And again, because uh, we don't have a market and because we have used it for a garden, we're looking at to expand that as well to hopefully do a farmer's market on that location uh, because the land is already partially cultivated. We were hoping to kind of extend that again to service the community in, a, uh, in the food desert that they're at. And again, also to support the youth, which they have come over to work on. And they are also disappointed in the fact that their hard work is now going to be taken away from them um, uh, because we have been working on that. We've also had youth uh, volunteer groups coming as well from all over the country to help us out in cultivating the land. So uh, it, it's ready and it's ripe to, um, to, to service the community and fresh fruits and things like that that it needs. Um, also, I will add that uh, even though uh, Mr. McCarthy may have received a letter from Mr. Johnson from the Oliver Community Association, um, I was formerly the secretary of the Oliver Community Association uh, up until a year ago and right when Mr. Johnson claimed the position of president. And I will say that um, legally, Mr. Johnson does not have a, uh, um, the authority to, uh, to give that uh, authorization because uh, uh, because I'm aware of uh, the transition and paperwork and things like that not being done. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson is claiming president. And again, I say that because I was the former secretary and had the records. And when the transition was done, it was not done properly. And their standing as an organization is not uh, in good standing at this point. And so therefore I say he doesn't have the authority to actually give that um, uh, okay to Mr. McCarthy to proceed in this manner. Um, and also um, one last thing is too, um, I'm, I did not, was aware that I had to, uh, um, the young lady before me, I, I'm, I commend her because she had her people ready. I did not know I would have to do that, but I can um, get letters from um, my, my, um, my employer who, uh, I bring um, our school children over, so she supports me in that. So I can get a letter from, and I work at St. Vincent de Paul, um, so I can possibly get a letter from them as support of what we do in the garden and, and the location. I can also get a letter from my church uh, as well um, as support of what I do in, um, at the garden and in, in the community. And I can also get other residents as far as uh, letters of support from them. Uh, saying that um, of the work that I do at the garden, as well as the need for a, a supermarket. And that's um, what I'm working on. So, and I believe, uh, oh, and also, and, um, and lastly, I did actually put in an application for that property myself, but it was not acknowledged because of the, the discrepancies between myself and Mr. Johnson. And thank you. I believe that is it. Thank you very much. Yeah, Ms. Carter, I had, I had a couple of... Uh, questions in light of uh, testimony you provided. Uh, and I think the last thing you said uh, went directly to that. Um, is it your understanding that anyone in the community is looking to acquire that property for the purposes of a supermarket? Um, yes, I'm working with a, a group now that we, um, uh, because uh, the supermarket uh, that was that most of the community was using just recently closed, I believe in September. And so, um, so when that closed, um, 
the group that I'm with, the, a group of community advocates have come together now to say, what, um, where can we put a market or how can we get a market in the community? So right now we're doing a lot of research in the area. We're calling the planning department to find out, you know, is anybody planning a market? Um, we're also contacting the other community associations that are around it, um, like Ms. Hammond, who was on here, and, and East uh, Broadway East, and some other organizations to ask them um, what's being uh, planned. We are sending a letter to uh, Councilman Stokes also to say what's in the 12th district, but not necessarily just in the 12th district, district as a whole, but what's in that Oliver community, Johnson Square, Broadway East, because there's no market at all within those areas. Well, uh, let me ask you, have you considered the fact uh, or the possibility that putting a housing unit uh, with seven, 70 uh, dwelling units uh, might help spur uh, uh, the creation of a supermarket might uh, sort of garner some support, more movement uh, uh, to have the community working with the city uh, to address that food desert situation particularly given that you'll have more residents in the area? Um, well, well, I'm gonna say it's, it's possibly like a catch 22 kind of thing, because if you have more residents and no market, then there's an issue. So, uh, and then the fact that we're looking at viable space as well. So we're looking at what kind of space can we use and um, uh, to, to put the market. And so, because, I'm gonna say that particular location is kind of in the middle of pretty much the three communities. I, I, I believe it would better serve there. And again, until we can get that market uh, up and running or get somebody in to get a market um, um, to have additional residents, I was I would think take away uh, more overpopulate uh, a situation of of we need. Uh, a, a market versus more individuals living in the community and we don't have the sustainability of food and and so many other resources to, to sustain those additional ones and again because the we have a, a, a what is it a, a garden on the on that location um, that could be used to uh, you know the location can be used and expanded to um, have a farm or um or have a uh yeah farmer's market and other things there to uh um to support the food need as opposed to the people need you know uh let me ask you finally uh have you or uh, you you've described your i guess affiliation or past affiliation with the community association uh, but might it behoove uh you and your compatriots to talk with the uh, developers uh, of that particular, of this particular project to see if uh, you can come together and compromise and, and have some kind of uh, designated area in that development for continuation of the garden. Okay, well, I have, I have, I've actually, I'm not sure if I spoke with Mr. McCarthy himself, but I did go to one of the community associations and made it known that, you know, who I was and the things we were doing on the, on the garden, uh, you know, at the garden. And, um, and at that point, uh, I guess they weren't receptive to, you know, extending it. They were just doing what they were doing. And, um, and I believe, um, I even asked if, um, you you know if you guys are going to go to go forward with whatever and at the time i didn't know it was a 70 unit thing but if you guys are going to go forward could you at least help us in getting another location because we have really developed that area to uh, uh as a garden and and producing food and and the children are coming there and, and the community is coming there so could you help us and um and they were not receptive to that so um, so when I saw the sign about this, it was like, okay, well, I just want my concerns known that uh, we, we really need a market or um, we we need to continue in the garden because we have no food in the area versus um, having uh, additional 70 units of, of, of uh, individuals there. And my, my hope would be, you know, maybe they could also find another location for housing as opposed to um, building it there, where we would we could possibly use that place as a um, as a um, as a market or a garden. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Uh, we have two more raised hands. Um, first is Earl. I'm unmuting you now. Hello. Hello, everybody. How are you? I'm fine, sir. Could you state your full name, please? My name is Earl Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Go ahead, sir. Hi, I'm, I'm Earl. I am uh, the president of the Oliver Community Association. I'm also a member of the Sustainability Commission and a liaison with Baltimore City Wrecking Parks. Um, we, uh, I was a previous board member before I was president. Uh, we did have to remove board members for um, illegal activity. RG Carter was one of those board members who were removed. But um, in reference to the area of not having um, gardens, we have two farms. Um, one farm is on a 1600 block of Bethel. Um, I actually operate that farm. And the other barn farm is on a 1400 block of North Bond. I actually helped build that farm. That's the Six Branch farm. Uh, we are also discussing now with, the, uh, with housing and the Department of Planning of two market rate apartment buildings that will house um, a, a commercial market for the community. Um, we are in the processes right now of designing that those two buildings and working with housing and the Department of Planning on consolidating lots that is necessary for the building of those properties. Uh, we're, we're in total support of, of this of this um this project we have visited all his other projects um i don't represent myself i, I represent a board of, of of people who are residents of the community we uh asked all the hard questions we um he did not get initial approval for the board because we wanted to see what he was building and what he was bringing to the neighborhood it took us almost a year to for him to convince us that what he was doing was going to benefit the community, um, and we are all for it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your uh, input. Yep, no problem. All right. And the last raised hand is for Maria Strauss. Hello? Maria, and I think she was there for the last case. Ah, okay. I think her hand must have still been raised. Okay. Um, then that is all raised hands. Um, all messages on chat for this. And I don't see any uh, call-ins to unmute. All right. That looks like all the testimony for this one. Great. Uh, well, then we'll turn it back over to uh, you, Mr. McCarthy, for the final word. Now, let me unmute him. Sorry. Thank yeah, thank, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I do want to reiterate that we have, uh, you know, spent considerable amount of time working with the Oliver community uh, and talked with Ms. Carter about the relocation of the, the garden. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, we are we are trying to do our best to be part of the neighborhood. But as that is, uh, Mr. Earl just pointed out, there are several gardens in the neighborhood and several more that that he's working on. So, um, again, you know, we have done our due diligence. Uh, this is a, a project that uh, that is moving forward with your approval, and uh, we we look forward to your support on it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCarthy, for your presentation. We appreciate it. All right, that concludes uh, matter number 2020-185. Uh, moving on to the next matter on the docket. Ooh, all the way down to the bottom of the page here. Uh, case number 2020-193. 1000 through 1012, West 36th Street. The felon is Jay Geno. This is a request to use property known as one. 2006 West 36th Street for a tattoo shop. And I'll hear from staff and their planning. Nothing from staff. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the Hamden Business Area Urban Renewal Area. That particular urban renewal plan does not prohibit or restrict the proposed use. Uh, 
the uh, floor plan for this property uh, did not unfortunately include dimensions, so the department was unable to determine if there would be any variance of off street parking regulations required associated with this. But subject to that comment, the department has no objection to the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Mr. Rano. It's muted. Sorry. Oh, okay. He's Hello? on. Yes, Mr. Rado, tell us about your project, sir. Uh, yeah, we'd like to open a small tattoo studio in the space at 1006 West 36th Street. Um, you, you, you said that uh, we hadn't submitted dimensions. The space is about 500 square feet. Uh, it's a square, so about, uh, I guess that's um, uh, 20, 25 feet square. Okay. Um, no, we don't require you to do the math. It's okay. <laughs> it's hard to take the square root of 500 on the spot. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do, will, will you be up? Uh, see, do you are you currently in a tattoo business? Yes, something you mentioned. Yes, I've been, I've been tattooing about 20 years. Okay, and so you will be operating the shop there daily. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, do you have a sense of what uh, days of the week it will be open and what the hours will be? Uh, our hours are pretty flexible, um, usually about noon to 8 o'clock. All right. Is that every day? Uh, yeah. Um, the, the days fluctuate, yeah. Okay. Any additional questions for Mr. Rano? None from me. None from me. Um, to follow up on Martin's um, comment, so body art establishment, it's one off street parking space per thousand um, square feet of ground floor area, um, I believe. So um it looks like there's so it's the conditional use and then also it'll be a variance for one parking space okay. all right okay well, we'll uh, mr rano we're going to go uh and see if we can identify anybody else who wants to be heard on this matter mm -hmm. uh, if anyone would like to testify in this case, um, let me send me a quick chat or raise your virtual hand. Um, looks like both hands raised are from previous cases. Um, five, four, three, two. <laughs> all right, <laughs> that's everybody, Mr. Chair. All right, very well. Uh, all right, uh, Mr. Rano, final orders with you. Is there anything additional you'd like to add at this time or uh, uh, no. rest with the record? Uh, no, thank you. Very well. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, we'll move on to the next matter on the docket, case number 2020-194, 1729 Light Street and 1731 Light Street. This is a request to consolidate lots to construct a three-story rear addition with rear decks and use for five dwelling units. Now hear from staff and or planning. Nothing from staff. I mean, department reviewed this application, noted that this proper, these are two separate single family dwellings currently. And the proposal is to consolidate the two dwellings and basically turn it into a multifamily dwelling unit. The lot area is sufficient for the proposed use. However, the one issue that does exist in this area is off-street parking. The multifamily dwelling requirement is one off-street parking space per dwelling unit. Uh, for the five dwelling units, there would be three new parking spaces required, and only one, as far as planning can tell, is able to be provided in the rear yard of 1731 Light Street, because the other property basically is improved almost completely. As this would not meet the required amount, the applicant should consider alternately shared parking arrangements as described in subsection 16501B of the zoning code. Uh, 
the lot area variance may be required if uh, a separate building that is fronting on Westfall Place at the rear of 1729 Lot Street is going to be used as a dwelling unit uh, in addition to the five dwelling units that are proposed in the main building uh, on Light Street. The department has no objection to the application, provided that the applicant can provide off street parking resources for residents of the proposed dwelling units. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Mr. Preto. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, thank you for your time. Nate Prettle uh, from AB Associates. I'm here on behalf of Yosef jo Lefkowitz, the property owner and developer, who is also on the uh, Zoom portion of this. Uh, so if you're the, um, the video, if you can find him and maybe I'm not sure that he's going to comment on here, but I'd like him to be available. And so I guess... Uh, Sorry, Nate, what was that name again? His name is Yosef, and I'd asked him to put the two appeal numbers in the, his, as his last name. So oh, yeah, we... I see him. Okay, very good. Thank you. So, and um, uh, Ms. Nadu, I believe you had also raised some issues about a potential conversion and consolidation issue. And if it's all right, I'd like to give a quick summary of the proposal and then touch on that afterwards. I was about to ask, do you want me to brief the board on the issue? Although it's in their staff report. <laughs> it's, up, it's up to you. I'm happy to give my, my take on it. Uh, and if you want to come in, however you'd like to do it. Okay. So the issue is that, as you guys know, for um, it's, it's an R8. So the conversion of a single family dwelling to a multifamily dwelling usually requires a city ordinance. In this case, it's two single family dwellings being consolidated. So that's why it was highlighted in your staff report as a possible conversion. Basically, is two side-by-side single-family dwellings that get consolidated. Is that now a multifamily dwelling and therefore not a conversion? Based on Martin's report, I'm guessing planning does not think so. So. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, first of all, again, um, thank you, Ms. Nadu. This is a proposal to take what was previously or um, – or is sort of in flux at the moment, which I'll describe two single family dwellings on you know, very large lots that stretch all the way back to West Street, approximately 120 feet deep. And, and to take those and build a small addition, one is two stories, one is three stories. They build a uh, rear addition on the existing three stories to add some extra floor area and reuse the buildings as five dwelling units. Mr. French, I'm glad you brought up the part about the sort of carriage house garage on the back of, um, I believe, 17. 29 that is actually being demolished so one it will not be used as an additional dwelling unit now or in the future and two that addresses the off street parking issue as well because that's going to be torn down to allow for extra off street parking in the rear and i apologize the plans while they do show uh, either note or show both of those things it's not readily apparent i think the the uh, notation of demolishing the garage you know is just really on the corner of one of the the sheets so we believe we can fit at least five spaces in there more if we're using the shared parking described by mr french i would ask the board just because it's not clear that all five of those uh or would meet the zoning code's definition of a parking spot I and mean, yeah, certainly four of them would i would ask that you know if, should the board grant this request they include an off street parking variance for one unit or uh, for one off street parking space and there if this is considered multifamily after the conversion there's also a technical variance for an interior side yard on this addition you know, you're in a row house neighborhood but here we have the situation where if this is considered multifamily which we're arguing that it is you have a 10 foot interior side yard requirement so we'd ask the board to grant that variance in, in regards to the conversion issue, I uh, mean, yes, uh, my client and I agree with the planning department and frankly, the zoning administrator and how they've handled these. Whereas if you do have two properties that are consolidated, you de facto have a new two unit building. And part of the reason this is not consolidated yet is because delays both in the city and state from COVID. My client, uh, when he purchased the properties, had to submit the transfer to put them under the same entity. That transfer tax was approved and completed by the state in early August. But apparently there's a three month delay or backlog at least for that to get recorded in the system to allow property records um, in the city's property records to finish their consolidations. So this has been going on, frankly, for four or five months. Uh, we have an email from Don Flannery who handles these from the city saying that they're close, but they've been waiting for the state for quite a while. And so, um, and if you were to take this conversion issue further down, you'd have you know, two potential options. One would be you know, if you know, the board or any zoning administrator consider this a conversion, 
you know, the, the recourse would be for the developer just to tear both of them down and build it right back exactly the same as a permitted use, which uh, multifamily is in an RA. The second would be to uh, you know, wait for the consolidation to be complete and go get a new occupancy permit, which we may have had the potential to do. I don't think that should be necessary because it's really it's just an extra step that doesn't accomplish anything, you know, in my in my opinion. But you know, we frankly we could have done that if this were to have um, gone in the typical you know, time frame. But other than that, I'll, I'll um, I guess, answer any questions, but I should mention that this proposal was presented to the South Baltimore Neighborhood Association. Um, they did not take a position, but their new, new president, Sam Kogan, who I've been in contact with quite often on this, you know, said it was okay for me to mention that they had no objections and but they are overhauling their development review process and felt that they did not want to comment on anything until their association has their internal procedures done. So I'll leave it at that um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions and I urge the board to approve this appeal. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board at this time? I don't have any. No. None from me. Okay. Um, if anybody uh, would like to testify, please raise your virtual hand or send me a message so I can unmute you. All right, no hands raised, Mr. Chair. Uh, very well. Um, well, Mr. Credle, let me give you one more opportunity to provide any, to add anything else uh, to your application. It's a uh, Sure. Really involved presentation, but go ahead if there's anything else you'd like to add. Sure. I would just reiterate that again, these are unique properties, specific, you know, certainly after you know this consolidation is considered that you'll have the largest lot on the block, you know, which it leads itself to its use as five dwelling units, which again are permitted um, under the lot area requirements for R8. And so it's really it's just a small variance that we're asking for, both in off-street parking as well as this interior side yard variance. Uh, it would uh, you know, submit that you know, this meets the required findings and the standards for uniqueness and hardship based on the you know, having a multifamily property on the largest lot um, in the middle of this row house block. And again, I would urge the board to approve this request. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Preto. We'll take that up. Uh, while I have you here, are you prepared to go forward right now with uh, case number 197? Yes, I am. We're on West Cross Street. All right, I'll call that matter since we have the applicant. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just mention that my same client who is on currently on uh, that Ms. Nadu had added is also the developer property owner. So if you could leave him on for this one, because I think I will need him to testify. Uh -huh. So formally, we'll call the matter of 20, case number 2020-197, 1201 West Cross Street. Uh, the applicant is Mr. Pretel. Uh, this is a request to construct a second and third floor rear addition with the rear deck to use uh, for two dwelling units and first floor commercial use. And I'll hear from staff and planning. Okay. We have two letters in opposition. The first is from the Citizens of Pigtown um, Community Association, which states, I'm writing to you on behalf of Citizens of Pigtown Community Association membership and our opposition for zoning appeal the property at 1201 West Cross Street. It has come to our attention this property and its owner requesting the appeal have acted irresponsibly and unsafely. The renovations to add floors, the existing rear addition have resulted in trash and debris being left to accumulate and block the sidewalks. The manner in which work has been completed thus far does not instill confidence in the owner's ability to add value to our neighborhood. Also, the property owner has not engaged the community to address questions and issues with the proposal. Um, he sent an agent to discuss the proposal, but was not able to make any guarantees on corrective actions. Therefore, on November 30th, 2020, the Board of COP voted on behalf of the community to write the proposition, and that was from the President, Kelly Eastman. The second letter of opposition is from the Pigtown Main Street, which states, please accept this letter of opposition. Pigtown Main Street strongly disagrees with this appeal for several reasons. Most importantly, because 1201 West Cross Street LLC has demonstrated to be an irresponsible property owner, unsafe to the community and future tenants, and does not adhere to Baltimore City policies, including permitting, including permitting trash collection and property maintenance regulations. This property came to our attention after several neighbors contacted Pigtown Main Street 
about construction materials and trash accumulating at the property and unprofessional construction methods. The owners cannot be trusted to maintain additional units and especially a commercial property that may produce additional trash, noise, and lighting that can be a neighborhood nuisance. They've been non-responsive to concerns and the evidence of the property owner's negligence includes the following. Um, first, no permits. Construction, construction has begun several times without permits, including demolition and gutting the inside. Um, there's photos here. I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's of a back wall that's been built. Um, and then next, it says unsafe. The owner allowed piles of bricks thrown to the sidewalk to remain blocking the walkway during unpermitted demolition of the outside wall. The toilet has been sitting on the second story steps that appears to be collapsing. The toilet has been sitting on these steps since January 2019. Also, the construction and demolition has been extensive without permits that would require fines and inspections. Um, the bricks were brought to my attention by a neighbor who fell after tripping on them. Um, in terms of being a negligent owner, much of the bulk dumping appeared to be that the property was being gutted and construction was underway. I spoke with one of the owners about the lack of permits last December. The owners knew the work was not permitted, that trash was collecting, et cetera, and no action was taken to correct the problem. It is due to these reasons um, that we sincerely hope you vote to reject the appeal. Um, and there are photos of trash and the piles of bricks. And that's it for letters from staff. Planning department reviewed this application, noted that this property is in the Washington Village Urban Renewal Plan area, as well as in the Pigtown National Register Historic District. The Urban Renewal Plan does not prohibit or further restrict the proposed use. The property was last authorized for use as a tavern, which is a non-conforming use in the R8 district. The application refers to first floor as commercial space without specifying what that use would be. Under the terms of the R8 zoning district, uh, if this was no longer a tavern, then this would be neighborhood commercial establishment space, but the applicant should specify to the board what specific type of neighborhood commercial establishment would use that uh, first floor space. The amount of lot area variance required for the additional dwelling unit would be approximately 15%. The structure does currently cover 100% of the property and therefore the applicant has no ability to provide an off-street parking space on the site. And the applicant should either obtain the parking variance or indicate where the off-street parking would be provided for its use. Uh, in addition, because this is a National Register Historic District, the property is eligible for historic tax credits for restoration and renovation, and the department encourages the applicant to contact Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation staff to discuss that possibility before going ahead with any other improvements that might be authorized. The department has no objection to the application in its current form, such as the comments already made. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, tell us about this project uh, and if you could address the issues that have been raised absolutely in, uh, in the letters sure sure mr chairman again thanks again nate prettle here with yosef lethkowitz who's the owner and developer and yeah there's a clear you've heard there's a lot here to this case and you know on its face it is a pretty straightforward request and before i get into the other things let's you know, just make sure that we're clear about what is being asked for at the board today and mr french was absolutely correct in his uh, staff report that you know, this was a previously non-conforming tavern, which you know has been extinguished. And my client has all intentions of keeping um, extinguished you know, forever and never trying to reestablish that. We are not asking the board for neighborhood commercial establishment approval today because we need a, uh, a specific use and a specific tenant to do that. But what we were indicating on the application is you know, we are asking for the two units, which require, again, a 15 percent lot area variance as well as an off-street parking variance, which I'll you know, make my arguments about why the board should approve. But we're essentially keeping that space as is for now until, one, we either find a commercial tenant and come back to ask for neighborhood commercial establishment, or, and I'll get into this in a little bit, uh, we plan on you know, continuing to uh, meet with the community association, and based off of some initial comments I had heard from Pigtown Main Streets, 
that uh, they were really only opposed to the commercial space. And I suggested, well, you know, maybe we come back for another apartment there. And so that's sort of up in the air. But in the meantime, and partic- particularly to address some of the issues that were raised by both community groups, we were asking for approval for these two apartments to move forward. Um, for, again, a unique property, uh, the corner lot has a, a unique previous use, a unique construction, as well as it's uh, the largest uh, lot, the largest property in, on that block and takes up largest structure, I should say, takes up the entire lot, which allows for the two units, which is a minimal variance. Um, and I'm going to turn this in over in a second to my client to address what I think are the more serious issues here are the uh, things that were raised by the community association, because working without a permit is something that you know, we uh, everyone uh, takes very seriously and should never be done. And we have some explanations about why that happened. Um, one thing I should mention, you know, a, the uh, citizens of Pigtown letter said, well, the, uh, the owner has never contacted us, you know, as is you know, authorized representative in these, you know, I, we absolutely, we had a, a very nice presentation to the community association. I don't know that it should be held against him that it was me making the presentation or not. He, frankly, none of these issues were raised in that community association meeting, not not a single one of them. And I don't, you know, don't blame the, necessarily blame the community for that, but we didn't hear about this later until Pigtown Main Street, so at least I didn't hear about it, Pigtown Main Street's executive director called me on, on my cell phone and brought them up and I brought them to the attention of my client. And there have been some changes made since this work. And I, if I may turn it over to Mr. Lefkowitz so he can explain why this um, these things happened, what he's doing to address them and what he plans to do you know, in the future to continue to address this and make sure that this situation you know, does not remain and it will not uh, come back up in the future. Very well. Joseph? Yes. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Um, so to give the board just a brief rundown of how this went, there was a uh, individual who was running the Baltimore uh, investments for my family and who was doing work as such as specified in that letter. So I Yosef, Yosef I'm sorry. Could you explain who you, who your family is and where you know the fact that you know, where you're coming from? I'm sorry. So basically, my family is uh, is is well, they're located all over, but and they have uh, different arms to our family business in different states and countries. Baltimore is one of the areas where we inv- actively invest in, and um, there was someone down here who was running the operation originally, and was throwing a lot of money around and not working, you know, ethically according to building codes, according to building standards with permits and so on and so forth, and trying to cut a lot of corners. Uh, When my family actually got wind of what was going on, they immediately relieved him of his position, and they brought me in from from London to come in and try and rectify the problem. Uh, When I came down here, I immediately shut down all the projects that were up and running um, that did not have the proper accreditations as far as zoning goes and as far as uh, permits go, and they've all remained closed. Not one of them has been reopened. Um, and immediately after shutting down all the projects, I immediately became um, aware of the process that needed to be taken. I hired Al Barry and Nate Patel for uh, planning and zoning, immediately took on NW2 uh, engineers for um, architectural plans and engineering and started to put every single one of the projects back into line into course that they're supposed to be, um, which includes planning, um, zoning, and permitting, according to Baltimore City's guidelines. Um, Frost Street was one of the properties, unfortunately, that was handled this way and was also shut down for that purpose and has remained shut down. Um, The my understanding was, and, and I'm, I don't have this by fact, so I can't give it to you, but my understanding was there was actually a demolition permit pulled originally for the property. Um, I, I don't remember if that's 100% or not, so neither here nor there. Our intentions are quite opposite of what they appeared to be um, a year ago, which is to make sure that everything is 100% properly zoned and permitted to make sure that every development that we do is community friendly and in the best interest of the community that we're developing in. Um, and, and Washington Village, Big Town would be no different from any of the other developments that we're involved in. <clears throat> um, our intention is not to put a tavern back there. Our intention is simply to create 
nice, comfortable living spaces that offer something to the community rather than become a burden on the community. Um, and since putting things back into the correct measure, um, we've, we've been able to open up several projects. We've been able to get things moving properly, permitted properly, zoned properly. Um, and this is one of them, which we're appealing to the board here to do the same thing and to be allowed and afforded the chance to, you know, I guess prove ourselves to the pick down and Washington Village community, an area where we own a number of properties. And we definitely want to see the the improvement in the area rather than the blight. Thank you, Yosef. No, oh, sorry, James, you're on mute. Um, Mr. Preddle, do you want to leave it there? Do you want to add anything at this point before we hear from uh, anyone else? I think um, maybe I'll wait and save the, um, my fun uh, testimony until after Miss Lane, I think, who's on, uh, gives her testimony. Uh, that is well. correct. Um, I, have, I have a question. I have a is, question also. So is the purpose of the, are you turning it into just general commercial space? To so, rent it? Yeah, so th it will essentially be a shell that will be available for a tenant fit out or whatever the next step is after we go back to the community association to come before um, this board for a neighborhood commercial establishment. We have to have an office tenant or, you know, a specific restaurant. And so, so until we have that, you know, we're not going to ask for it. But in the meantime, under, let's say we get approved today, we get a building permit. They can, you know, s secure the space as a you know, future commercial shell and do the work on the upper floors for the residents. So it basically we would sit there again. We, our plan is to go back and you know, discuss. Does the for what I heard, the community may not want commercial at all there. And you know, do we ask for another unit and come back for the board? We're we're not entirely sure. But getting this approval today for the two units upstairs would allow us to you know, further secure the building and bring it up to you know, uh, what we would hope it to be you know, a. Uh, an asset rather than a detriment to the community. So in none of the prior conversations with the community, they indicated to you what they were looking for as far as what they wanted, et cetera? No, and I don't want to speak for the community, but what I, I had heard is we, you know, under this owner, we don't want any commercial space, you know, and that's the way I understood it, but I'm certainly not going to speak for the community. They're here and they can say, I mean, that was an initial um, conversation a few weeks ago. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Who is the second speaker? Is he still on? Uh, yes, Mr. Yosef. Yes, I am. Yeah, Mr. Yosef. Um, how many how many uh, projects do you have in Baltimore City, and who manages them? So, I manage them with a with a team. I'm actually in Baltimore, local, um, and have been for some time. And how many projects we have open, Nate? Uh, quite quite a number. I don't have the exact <laughs> number, but there's several. A um, majority in the Little Italy neighborhood, as well as some others, uh, Mr. Cunningham, that you had seen today on White Street, a few that were postponed. So spread across mostly south and southeast um, and southwest Baltimore in here. All right. So you're going to stay. You're going to stay in town and manage these. Is that correct? I do, sir. Yes. And you don't know how many there are. Well, I know how many projects we're currently working on, which is 18. Uh, how many of them are currently open running right now? We've got three in Little Italy, I believe. We've got one, two that we're trying to get running right now. We've got uh, five in Federal Hill. Um, and we've got another five in Little Italy that we're currently plant dealing with uh, uh, um, that we're currently dealing with planning and permitting on. Um, we've got this in Pigtown, plus we've got another single family. We've also got a few more in Pigtown that are coming up now. Uh, we're we're in the in the premature stages. We haven't exactly put together the plan on it yet of course of action. I've had them before with them. Um, are they all, are they all res residential? 
most of our most of our projects are residential. However, there are I would say about a third of them have a commercial component to them, have a mixed use component. What type of commercial? What do you have in your other buildings? Um, we've got offices. We've got um, one building in um, Little Italy where we, where we would like to put a supermarket for the community. Uh, we've got a, another commercial space, um, which is a restaurant. We've got uh, more offices. Uh, another commercial space in uh, on on Light Street, which was postponed now until uh, which was postponed. Um, Mr. Cunningham, if if I may, you know, um, I think part of the reason it's hard to describe the commercial uses, and uh, Mr. Barry and I are involved in all the ones of Little Italy, because I think this is probably the most difficult time to find office and restaurant tenants. You know, certainly of my lifetime. So, and I don't know if that necessarily should be. Um, uh, held against Mr. Lefkowitz, but I will say we've been engaged in a significant community process for months and months in Little Italy on his projects, and we're, we continue to work through that. Our, our our goal our goal with our with our projects, to be more specific, is to and and I'll speak specifically for the ones in Little Italy, is to keep the commercial components, is to keep them viable options for people to come in and put businesses and small businesses, especially during the current. You know, epidemic where in affords those spaces are still available. I know a number of people who, who we're in touch with, you know, are trying to convert their commercial spaces into residential spaces uh, for bottom lines and so on and so forth. We don't want to take away those commercial components. We want to keep them viable for the communities. Um, another thing, which you guys had asked me, how many current projects we have running. So I want to reiterate something. When I actually came into Baltimore. I shut down all of our projects to vet every single one of them to make sure that they were properly zoned, permitted, and that we were building according to the use that was allowed, according to Baltimore City's guidelines and zoning rules. Um, so we're just becoming, we're just getting back alive with our projects right now. Uh, all of them seem to be progressing one after another into the development stage. Um, and and that's why we're dealing with all of them as a bulk really because of how we had to restructure everything and you know res resubmit everything and, and do things well the proper way all right thank you okay um Ms. lane did you still want to share your screen um i i can if the uh if the commissioners want to see the photos on the letter. So. Sure, I'd like to see them. All right, I am making you a presenter now. Um, so you'll see at the top, if you go to share, you'll see the option to share your screen. Okay. And Ms. Lane, as you're, as you're describing what it is we're seeing, uh, just be sure to include the dates of uh, these things and, and the yeah. most recent. Yeah, uh -huh. sure will. So uh, uh, this property first came, so first of all, let me state that Pigtown Main Street and citizens of Pigtown work hand in hand together. And that last community association where this property was presented, what was presented is that the commercial space would be an art gallery or something like that. So there was a proposal around some type of commercial space. Um, I can tell you as a Main Street manager, and as you can imagine, getting new businesses is really difficult right now and will be for the foreseeable future, especially into areas that aren't currently, you know, they aren't currently known as a location. So there was a commercial space that was presented. Um, the property was also requested, requested to present either the day of or just the day before the association meeting. And so therefore the community members really didn't get to get out and look at the property and things like that. However, this property came to my attention last December because uh, you'll see this first picture, this wall, there was demo happening inside the property and they were just throwing the bricks down here and they, and 
Um, so, you know, there's this illegal construction, actually two or three people on the block called and texted me. I went down, I actually spoke to the owner on the phone who, uh, was in the hospital at the time and da, 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 and just kind of yelled at me. I'd already looked up. I knew there were no permits. In fact, there have been no permits for this property until October 2nd of this year. And so this was taken December, 2019. That's the first picture. The second, this illegal, uh, there's actually more that's been added onto it since this first picture, this back part. It's a bad photo, but like there's a toilet up here still. It's not secured properly um, the way that a vacant or unoccupied building needs to be secured still. Um, this was part of the beginning of the process. Again, this was the bricks that were thrown down on the sidewalk. Um, and so this was around the same time, December, January of last year. And this last row of photos that you see, this was just taken uh, right the day before I sent the letter. So what was that, a week and a half ago? And these are periodically that neighbors send me um, because of the trash debris. And as far as I can tell, there has been continued, some continued demolition within that building before the December or before the October 2nd permit was filed. And so, I mean, at this point, right, the, the owner has been negligent. And to build an additional construction or additional apartment onto that space, I mean, we're not even clear right now, based on this testimony, now what they're asking for, um, you know, approving a third apartment in this space would then create some issues around parking for the neighbors, but also, you know, the amount of work that's already been done without permits just seems dangerous. This is the corner right here where the uh, tavern operated. And, and this is a question um, I hope you all could answer. My understanding is if there has not been a continued use of a commercial property and it's zoned R8, uh, then it does require approval from zoning. Is that correct? Because this property has been vacant for at least six to seven years, according to the neighbors, and at least two and a half years since I've worked in Pigtown. To answer your question, um, any commercial space that went in there would be considered a neighborhood commercial establishment. Um, and yes, they would have to come to the board to get a permit for any uh, commercial entity to operate in that space. So I think what part of the, I mean, part of the discussions we've had with the neighborhood and part of our opposition is that this, if I, you know, I should have showed you the whole intersection here. There's a convenience store on the opposite corner. They're one block away from Washington Boulevard, which is our commercial corridor. I mean, the biz, the community does not, has expressed they don't want to see more business within the residential area. And I think that is especially uh, strong in this case, or they feel especially strong in this case, as does so does Pig Down Main Street, due to the negligence of maintaining this property. You know, if a business owner or if a business goes in there that creates any type of nuisance or trash or things like that, and additional units, how is that going to be managed? You know, right now we have great relationships with our property owners on Washington Boulevard and also throughout the neighborhood. Um, and so just the year, right? We're Yeah, it's now a year of working, trying to get this property just safe to be located, to be in the neighborhood while it's under construction. Um, based on that, and also the no need for additional commercial space commercial businesses in the community. We also have multiple projects happening with new apartment buildings in Pittsburgh. at the Mobtown Ballroom, which I think Mr. Yosef may be a part of this project. So we have on Berry Street, one on Starrett Street. So there's not a lack of affordable apartments or housing in Pigtown at this point. And this is a crowded 
uh, this, this block where these residents would park, both of these blocks, they're, they're not our blocks that have vacants and things like that. They're full, there's cars. I think the neighbors would um, have issues if, if a third unit's put in there and then a parking issue comes up. So, so that's, that's it. When you, when you say a third unit, you mean the commercial space being filled? Because well, they're only looking for two dwelling units. Right, Mr. Field. What I was told by Mr. Prettle is if they don't get the commercial, then they're going to go for a third apartment. And so, and I don't really understand that because when we work with investors and developers, you know, you have your plans and <laughs> that's based upon what you need per square foot. Da, da, da. So I don't, I don't understand what they're doing there. I don't know. It's, it's conflicting information. Okay. Ms. Lane, you, you mentioned that you went to the site and spoke to the owner. Was that Mr. Joseph? I believe it was. I spoke to him on the phone. The, uh, the, the, um, the company that was doing the demolition, the workers called him and I got on the phone with him and told him informed him what was happening, that these bricks are being thrown, that there was debris everywhere, that this, and then, it, and then they still installed this third story illegal, you know, without permits. And I spoke to, he represented himself as the owner. I did not write down the name right then, but uh, he sounds the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I may. Um, Ms. Lane, I, I hear that you have spoken to one of the owners. Uh, however, thank God till today, my family and myself all remain perfectly healthy and have not been in the hospital uh, uh, over the past year. Uh, to reiterate again, and, and I don't know exactly who you spoke to, I'm actually kind of curious, um, but it definitely wasn't to me or to my immediate family members. Um, in regards to the things that you brought up in the pictures that you're showing over here, which I definitely understand the concern. Um, this is this is one of the reasons uh, why I was brought in here to do this. This is the reason why the building has remained shut down. Nobody has been in that building since I've been in Baltimore, um, and and it remains shut down now. You know the pictures of the trash which which you present here. Um, they're trash which I I can't control. I can send my guys around to the property every week, every other week, uh, as often as possible. But I can't control the trash that's left there. As the building's been vacant and gutted for some time, there's no couches for us couches for us to throw on the curb or any trash of that nature to throw on the curb because nobody's there. Um, I can't. Correct. So when you hold a vacant building for over a year, this is what happens. Trash does accumulate and people do not care about the property and they will dump. And if you'd like to share the other members of your LLC, then maybe I would recognize one of the names and I could tell you who I spoke with. All right. Well, I think we understand. You spoke with someone who represented himself to be an owner. Uh, it may or may not have been Mr. Uh, Joseph, but uh, I think we get it. And, and if you could have the parties kind of address your comments to us, uh, the board. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, Ms. Lane, go ahead. I, I would like you to com complete your testimony so that we can uh, move forward to any other uh, callers or have a final rebuttal from um, the Apple. Is there anything else you'd like to share? No, just that, um, you know, there is a concentration of commercial properties within this, even really three, four block area of this building. Um, it was presented that it would be an art gallery or, or um, in this property uh, at the community meeting. Um, after the community meeting, when the board met, there was, you know, I think there's confusion also about if it's granted a commercial space. And so maybe they say there's going to be an art gallery and an art gallery doesn't make it. And what happens then? It, then what kind of commercial property can go into that space. I think there's a fear that if a commercial space was granted, then anything could go in. And secondly, um, 
the if instead of commercial space there's a third unit i think that be, does become a parking issue and such because this is a very this is it's a big property and so i would assume that the units will be two to three bedroom um and so then you're right so it's not just a single one bedroom single car per apartment and that's all all right thank you um thank you and, and mr Pirtle, mr joseph i, I want to hold uh any further comments for you until we can figure out whether or not there's any there are any additional uh folks who want to be heard uh, mr. Um. I have not received any messages about additional testimony, and I do not see any more raised hands. Uh, in that case, let me just ask, uh, I think we were, parking was raised as an issue. Um, just remind me, uh, Mr. Preto or uh, Mr. Yosef, what your plan is for parking at this location. Oh, I think they're both muted. Hold on, uh, Mr. Oh, okay. Petal, I am unmuting you. Yes, hello, hello. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if it's all right, maybe should I just go ahead and give my, yeah, summarize everything? Okay, absolutely. Sorry, absolutely. Sure. So um, first of all, you know, I'm not going to refute any of the you know, pictures or violations. Yeah, I have no reason to, to think those are not accurate. And I'll let uh, Mr. Lefkowitz's statement on what he plans to do about it stand for that. Yeah, I'm not sure where the confusion about what's being proposed is coming from, because both in my calls with Ms. Lane, the presentation of the Community Association and the application, we are only here requesting for two apartments you know, and, a, and a potential to come back for a commercial space. I've never heard of an art gallery. I don't know who spoke about that. The only thing I could think of is in describing the neighborhood commercial establishment process to the citizens of Pigtown, I ran down the list of potential commercial uses that fall under neighborhood commercial establishment, one of which is an art gallery. And I was just given an example, and it was clear that any commercial use would have to come back before this board. And this, the um, yeah, idea of a third unit, I certainly never said if we don't get commercial, we're putting in a third unit. The only time the fir that first came up is in my call with Miss Lane, when she told me we will oppose any commercial use that goes into this spot, you know, Point blank. I said, you know, I, and you know, I respect her opinion on that. I said, well, if that is the case, if commercial is, you know, um, that you know, sorry, is upsetting or for you know, for justified reasons, what you know, would you think it would be appropriate if we went back to citizens of Pigtown and proposed instead of a future commercial space a third unit? And I think, you know, I'm trying to uh, in this hearing not not you know, get into what may happen in the future, but certainly we're here for these two apartments today. I think that no one uh, wants this property improved as much as as Yosef does, we want to, you know, and this is the first step in doing the proper process. Get the zoning appeal, get the proper building permits. You know, he's working with a reputable engineer. And you know, Al Berry and myself, part of our role involved in this is to make sure that he does things the right way. So at a minimum, you know, we would ask the board to approve this appeal, let him do it the right way, get this, and, you know, and I'm, I would say uh, both Ms. Lane and the citizens of Pigtown have been you know, easy to contact and more than willing to negotiate. Certainly we don't see eye to eye at this point, and I, and I don't you know, you can blame them for having the position that they do, but you know, I'm here, we're here in good faith wanting to continue to work with them and we pledge to do so. And so again, based on, I think, the testimony I provided about the uniqueness of the property, some of the, uh, in regards to these two units, again, uh, we do not have an off street parking plan, I'll put it that way. We're in a national register historic district. We have a historic building that takes up the entire lot. It is not possible to provide off street parking on this lot. So at the time we would ask the board for this minimal lot area variance, as well as the off street parking variance, you know, with a pledge that, you know, we will, anything else that would have to happen would come back before this board. Very well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Prattle, uh and uh, Mr. Joseph for your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Lane, as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill, Bill, do you have any questions? Is that no. it? Okay. Uh, all right. Well, that will conclude uh, uh, matter number 2020-197, and we'll move forward to the final case on the docket, case number 2020-198, 3360 Annapolis Road. Uh, Pellon is, uh, or the applicant is Ryan Potter. This is a request to use uh, as a gasoline station, with convenience store, construct freestanding canopy over four dispensers, eight fuel pumps, 
convert the exi existing structure into a convenience store, install three 25 square foot identification signs, miscellaneous signs and 20 foot high double face 25 square foot freestanding identification with gasoline price pole sign. Uh, I'll hear from uh, staff and planning regarding this problem. Um, we can continue with 2021-98, but I believe we skipped 2021-96. Yeah, we did. Oh, that's right. We did. We did. You're right. You know what? Twenty. Well, let me ask. Um, does twenty twenty one ninety eight have opposition? Um, I believe it does. Give me one second. Hold on. Um, twenty twenty one ninety eight. Well, actually, so does one ninety six. So. Uh, yeah, one ninety eight does have. They both have opposition. All right, well, since I called the case, let's just go with 198. Sorry about okay. that. Um, do we have any staff reports for 198? So, yes, 198 has a letter in opposition. Give me one second. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. I wish to state that construction of seven construction of a 7-Eleven with gasoline pumps in the property is not needed in this area because in this vicinity there are three gas stations within a half mile distance. One, I never is it Sunoco? It is Sunoco. It's situated right opposite the site. Another Royal Farm is lo is also located on a quarter mile drive, and one 7-Eleven is located another quarter mile away. All five gas stations are on Patapsco Avenue and within less than one mile distance. Hence, it will not only be favorable, but it will not only be favorable, but also in addition to the harassment and discomfort for the residents of this locality. Um, and then he states that he was unable to attend the hearing himself due to medical, uh, due to medical issues. Planning department reviewed this application, noted this property is zone C3, which is an automobile oriented commercial zone. This is of course an automobile oriented intersection um, at the corners of Patapsco Avenue and Annapolis Road, very close to the Baltimore City Southern limits. The uh, site plan for this property was studied and approved by the site plan review committee on September 16th of 2020 and the department is recommending approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Mr. Potter, tell us about your uh, project. Yeah, sir. good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, can you hear me? Sir. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yes, Ryan Potter, uh, Gallagher, Avelius, and Jones on behalf of the applicant. Um, I will say that uh, I'm somewhat surprised to hear about the opposition. We met with um, the folks at the Halethorpe Improvement Association uh, twice and didn't hear opposition. So this is um, somewhat of a surprise to us, but uh, we're happy to address it and, and try to calm the nerves. Um, I, I was intending, if it's okay with you, to introduce Mike Gazelle, who is a civil engineer and who could talk just very, very briefly about kind of what the plan is uh, that was approved by the site plan review committee. Um, and, and if you, I don't know if you can make Mike. Uh, there he uh, is. Sure. Well, that'd be fine. He's here. All right. Hey, thank you, board. Uh, so this is Mike, Michael Gazelle with uh, Bowler Engineering um, on behalf of 7-Eleven. So we are looking to the, redevelop the property on the southwest corner of Pataps West Patapsco Avenue and Annapolis Road. Um, currently, there's an existing abandoned convenience store uh, located there that 7-Eleven is looking to renovate and upgrade that building and convert that into a proposed 7-Eleven convenience store. Um, as part of that, there's no expansion or addition to that existing building, um, simply interior and exterior improvements. Additionally, they're gonna construct a fueling canopy with four fueling pump islands that have a total of eight fuel spaces um, for customers. Um, there will be uh, 10 parking spaces located around the building. Um, additionally, there'll be enhanced landscape improvements along the frontages of both roads and at the request of public works um, we will be upgrading the 
existing sidewalks and reconstructing the sidewalks along both road frontages as part of the improvements uh, for this site. Uh, can you answer any questions that you guys would have? There are actually two other 7-Elevens within a half mile of this location. Hello? So our understanding is that there's one 7-Eleven uh, down the street that as part of this redevelopment, that 7-Eleven will be, will be closing and that those services will be offered at the, this location uh, once this development is approved and constructed. Okay. What does 7-Eleven do, um, propose to do with the uh, soon to be vacant property? Ryan, can you answer that? Hello. Hello, Ryan. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Um, Sorry. Technical difficulty. Um, Mr. Cunningham, I, I, I don't think we, we quite know yet what um, they will do with that property, to be perfectly honest. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, make something up. It, these things take time, um, and that site is not ideal for a convenience store, and this one is. So, um, in fact, it was a convenience store previously, so we're sort of restoring it to its former use here. Um, because it, it it's best suited for it, but to be you know again to be clear, I I wouldn't purport to tell you what we would do with the the site that will be vacated. Thank we you. don't know yet. Thank you. Okay. Um, but again, I mean, I I would like to to say that I mean we, we had two in the era of COVID. It's it's been odd, but we've had two virtual meetings with the community association, and we didn't have. Um, really any material concerns. Um, so I would almost follow the board's lead and that if there's anything we need to do with the community that, that you think we should undertake, we're happy to do it. It just, we didn't have any feedback negative at all um, through two meetings. Okay. Uh, and I would be happy also, Mr. Chairman, if it, it uh, sorry to interrupt, I'd be happy to, Proffer. I mean, I, I believe firmly this meets all of the conditions, um, you know, in Title V for a conditional use, and I'd be happy to proffer or go through them one by one, even if it would, um, you know, be desirable. But I don't think it's proper. No, I think uh, I think we're I think we're fine on that, unless the board uh, feels differently. Um, uh, and I think you've addressed. Uh, the things that are of concern, certainly that, are, that have been raised. Uh, do we have, uh, is there anyone else, uh, Mr. Potter, that you'd like to, to offer uh, to testify on any other point? Okay, keep going out. Um, looks like he's still there. Uh, Mr. Potter? I'm sorry, I lost you again for a moment. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> no problem. The, the 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 question is: Is there anyone else, uh, in addition to uh, uh, the architect or any other uh, professional, you'd like to offer uh, in support of uh, the presentation at this time? Or uh, no, no, sir, Mr. Chairman. I'm I'm sorry. No, we're we're, we're all set. Okay. Uh, we. Uh, Search for any callers who wish to be heard on this matter. I don't see any raised hands, but I do. It does look like now we do have someone who's called in at some point. Um, call in user six, phone number four four three nine one five. You are unmuted. If you are here to testify on this case, please say so. If not, you may remain silent. You're going to hear two beeps, meaning you've been unmuted. Okay. <laughs> I don't think she's here to testify on this. Um, all right. I think that's everything. All right. Uh, all right. So, uh, 
Mr. Potter, any final words <laughs> of the presentation? <laughs> I don't think there will be, but I gotta ask. Probably lost him again. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm uh, given 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 his last remarks, I, I think I'm satisfied that we heard uh, what we need to hear from the Helen, the applicant. Um, we'll uh, with that we'll wrap up uh, case number twenty twenty dash one ninety eight, and move to true final case on the regular docket twenty twenty dash one ninety six eight eighteen in North Broadway. Uh, the applicant is uh, Elizabeth Johnson, and this is a request to use the entire premises as a grocery store. All right. Staff received a letter in opposition that states, um, I oppose the establishment of 818 North Broadway as a grocery store. 818 North Broadway is directly across the street from the Kennedy Krieger Institute. Institute. The building has never been used for a commercial purpose in the past. Usage of this building as a grocery store will only depreciate and damage the character of this recently revitalized section of Baltimore, Kennedy Krieger, and Johns Hopkins as a whole. Will the full service grocery store and church square shopping center only 500 feet from this location? There is no critical need for a grocery store here. I request the opinion of Kennedy Krieger Institute should be asked before this use permit is granted. Um, the location is only 200 feet from an existing small business already struggling to survive at 900 North Broadway. Um, I should note the author of this letter owns that store at 900 North Broadway. And that's it for staff. All right. The planning department reviewed this application, noted it's in the Gay Street 1 Urban Renewal Plan area. Also in the Old East Baltimore National Register Historic District, which makes the building eligible for historic tax credits if it's renovated to those standards. The urban renewal plan does not prohibit or restrict the proposed use. The proposed use would function basically as a neighborhood commercial establishment. The building itself is one of five historic library buildings known in Baltimore as the Carnegie Libraries uh, that were the first part of what became the Enoch Pratt Free library system. It is located near the Church Square Shopping Center, and there is a community need for healthful food, particularly since the grocery store that was at that shopping center has closed. The important thing for the applicant to, to inform the board of, in the opinion of the department, is the nature of the merchandise and produce that would be sold here if this application would be approved. The department has no objection to the application and would be supportive of a use that, which would bring healthful and wholesome foods to an area of Baltimore that has been identified as a food opportunity area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Ms. Johnson, we'll hear from you. Hello. Hello. Um, Tell us about your project. I would like to address the fact that, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, it's, I consider it my business to be a social enterprise. Um, so we want to solve local problems, but also be a profitable business um, as well. Um, as you've heard through previous testimony, there's a lot of need for healthy foods. Um, even just having those local farms that are growing veggies, they will still need a place to market them so that they're available to the customers. Um, I would like to um, bring fresh fruit and vegetables to the community, as well as pre-packaged foods that are a whole grain and, and nutritious. Um, being in the medical community, um, the location of the building being in the medical community, uh, I'm sure they're talking to their clients about eating healthy and their patients. And so I wanna make sure that they have the option across the street. Um, we're particularly interested in funding, I'm sorry, um, before I get to that, we're particularly interested in sourcing items from veteran owned and minority owned businesses. And we have reached out already to um, some of these companies who are willing to bring their items um, lo locally. Uh, and let's see, we want to address basically food, the food crisis and hunger um, and accessibility to fresh foods. Um, 
there's a lot of uh, group homes and residential programs that are local. Um, a lot of the foods that they do have access to in the smaller establishments are uh, sugary snacks and prepackaged stuff that um, are not as necessarily healthy for them. And so um, this will be a way to uh, give access to um, healthier items. I just wanted to address the previous com the comments from the letter that it has had a non I'm sorry a commercial use. It was previously a library and a church, so it's had the foot traffic, and had um has you know been a community, uh, a meeting place for, um since its inception. Um, also, in the letter says there's another store, but that has recently closed as well as the other store that a uh, supermarket that closed before it, um, the save a lot that was on the Hartford Road corridor. Um, and I know that there is an uh, uh, East Baltimore uh, development plan redevelopment and they are trying to find um, a grocery. I'm not sure if they have already for um, their larger projects, but when you have the smaller supermarkets that are not sustainable closing up, I'm sure that is not, you know, probably not as attractive to um, another person or another uh, vendor to come in and do the same thing on a larger scale. Um, what else? That's pretty much it. All right. So thank you for hearing my testing. All right, Ms. Johnson, do you have a sense of um, a plan for the hours of operation for the grocery store? I, I thought about this, um, having it initially, my thought was to have a 12 hour day but because it's in the medical community and, and the location, we wanted to have a, um, a schedule that's similar to a 7-Eleven, which is pretty much 24 hours, um, because the hospitals and the other established medical establishments are pretty much running day to all day. It's always traffic. It's right by the uh, subway, um, a block from the metro and you have a lot of uh, foot traffic pretty much 24 hours. So if that was permitted, we would. And But if we have to work on the hours based on guidelines, we'd be willing to be flexible with that as well. Are you also prepared to have um, sufficient lighting and security cameras on the premises outside? And yeah. outside? Yes, sir. We have currently installed, I believe, eight security uh, cameras on the exterior of the building. Um, there would be a lot of uh, cameras on the interior of the building. Um, we have also uh, have guard posts. There's a guard post for that area that uh, on the Broadway um, median strip, there are uh, guard posts on to the north and south of the property. Um, and the, uh, so um, uh, what else? On the interior, we're going to add more cameras when the actual store is open. But right now, it's not. There's um, not. It's not necessary. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Johnson, I'm looking at your drawing, and uh, it looks like on the first floor you have something labeled as the main hall. Is actually is that where the grocery store will be located? Yeah. So there on the first floor plan. Let me go into that. On the main floor, yes. So that's a eleven twenty-two, correct? Um, eleven twenty-two and seven ninety. Is this are the square footage, which is not labeled? I see. I'm looking at a drawing. It says main hall, and then behind that is the stage area. Yes. What so all of that will be dedicated to the as floor space for it. The stage area, there's just a stage that was there that was used with the former church that will be um, disassembled. And then, um, so that will be included in, in the, the layout of the store as well. So okay. we're the stage area in the main hall. And this building, like they, uh, that was previously mentioned by planning, um, they, uh, it's one of the, it's a historic building, one of the five original libraries that were built. Um, for in addition to the uh, the main library on Cathedral Street, and so it's 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 very beautiful, and I want it to be able to, to share it with the community. I've, there were other projects that uh, came up, and we considered to do something that could benefit the community in other ways, but 
um, bringing food seemed to be the most needed thing. And especially um, we, our planning began before the pandemic and then after the pandemic happened, um, the, the reality of having essential businesses and uh, food access became such a important topic. And it has been even prior to, um, we decided that food would be the best thing for the community. Now, I'm looking at a drawing of a lower level, it looks like. Um, yes. And I see a dining room and a food prep area and a kitchen. Is that what you're proposing to do? That part will be mainly kept for the storage in the lower level. So I plan to, that's, that's one of the main things, is to have a lot of inventory, um, to have the food that's able to, 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 um, to sustain the community. So the lower level is going to be mainly for storage. On the upper level will be for um, for the like the floor. So okay. we will make improvements to make sure that it's ADA accessible um, to the front by adding a ramp, et cetera. So your your two drawings are show they show what's there presently, right? Yes, sir. And okay. we're not building walls like going to build up any walls. We're going to keep the existing um, floor plan. Okay. And you said you wanted to operate twenty four hours a day, seven days. If possible, yes. And the thing, and, and I wanted to also mention um, kind of what inspired um, beyond all of this to, to move to this project. Uh, for example, in Canton, along the waterfront, you have Harris Teeters, you have a Safeway. They just put a farmer's market. I forgot the name of the, um, but there's, it's a farmer's market that they just opened. Um, in this community, there's nothing. There's no really fresh food. So I would like to bring something to the community that looks just as beautiful as your home foods or your, your whole food store, your Harris Teeters, but it's a smaller store, but it's still beautiful and, and, and helping the community. So it's not just like a, um, a corner store that's stock, stocked with um, chips and, you know, artificial juices. You actually have wholesome foods, you have organic products, you have locally sourced, and we'll have imported things as well um, that are that, that for, the, for the community. So still working and operating as a business, but um, bringing something that is actually helpful as well. Could you operate with, if you didn't get approval for the 24 hours, would you still be able to operate? Yes, we would be. Um, we do have one person on the line who wants to testify. Uh, Ms. Cooper, you are unmuted. Hello, Ms. Cooper? So you're on here. Let me try. Um, okay. It does say she's unmuted. It's not letting me make her a panelist, though. Um, let me see if she tried calling in. All right, I see two call-in users now. If you're here to testify on this case, um, please go ahead. You'll hear two beeps, meaning that you are unmuted. Hey, what's going on? Okay. <laughs> you versus a different phone call. <laughs> All right. Second uh, call in user. Same thing. You'll hear two beeps when you're unmuted. Hi. Yes. I'm a current homeowner in the um, area. And Sorry. Before you start, what's your name for the record? Lisa Holmes. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we currently have no parking in our area and to bring a 24-hour business into a uh, residential neighborhood completely residential neighborhood it's going to disrupt the uh the actual homeowners in this this area um th there's no parking available period for the homeowners that live here and to bring a 24-hour business into the neighborhood it is going to become a um it's going to become a, a a nuisance for the actual homeowners 
in the area. So the 24 hour idea, I have a very big issue with. And in addition to that, um, I feel like there's going to be multiple, um, it's, it's already a crime driven area and it's going to bring additional people to the neighborhood, which I feel like the, the crime er the crime is going to go up. I really do. Uh, Matt, can you tell me the, the extent of the uh, crime problem that you experience in that area right now? Uh, Break-ins of cars, um, they're shooting frequently. There was just a shooting uh, just yesterday on Broadway in, in Ashland that, that sits right at the corner of this business. I mean, I just feel like the more people that you bring into this area, it's going to drive the crime rate up more. And it's going to cause us an issue where there's the homeowners have one parking space now, and we have people from John Hopkins, we have people from Kennedy Krieger coming to park in our uh, spaces. We have to have these cars towed. I don't want to come home from work every day and have to have a car towed because someone else is in my parking space because they're in the market from you know nine o'clock at night or two, or whenever, even a minute during the day. I have an issue with having to um, fight for parking space when, when I'm already fighting for parking space here. I mean, I've been here for 35 years, and this this is, I mean, honestly, a horrible idea. There's a grocery store around the corner with ample parking. I know the grocery store was closed down, but why not go get that location and, and have all the parking that's available around there? This, this, I mean, it, it's just, I don't know. I, I think it's ridiculous. All right. Thank you for your uh, for your input, ma'am. Thank you. See All right. Forwards. And then one more time, Ms. Cooper, you are unmuted. Um, still nothing. It sounds like okay. Um, that's all the raised hands and call in users. Um, let me have a question back to Ms. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Johnson, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, what is your experience with the level of current level of crime in that in that area? Um, I live and, in I live in Baltimore City. Okay, so I've lived in Baltimore City for over thirteen years. Okay, even in my own community, there is crime. Um, so. The purpose of the building is to serve the actual local community. That was what um, the founder, Mr. Pratt, his intention was for all of the libraries when he developed the system, was to serve the community and to make sure that it was an accessible to all. Um, we do have parking. There's a three parking um, lot in the rear, but that is not required by zoning. Um, Crime, I have not had any break in since we've owned the property since July of 2018, of 20, I believe, 19. Um, so we've had no crime or any issues. Um, we have good relations with the neighbors um, to the rear of the property. Um, so I haven't really experienced anything as far as crime is concerned. And like I said, there is the security post to the north and south of the, the property on, on Broadway itself. And so is that was that was that within a matter of blocks? It's right on blocks? the median strip, and so the building is on Broadway, facing the entrances on Broadway, and then you have like the median strip, and then there are little guard posts and the little boxes, the little houses or little I don't know how to describe mm -hmm. them, but guard posts. And then, and that's um, uh, a Baltimore Police Department guard post. I believe this is a joint collaboration with the area hospitals to provide security for the area. Yeah. Yeah, they're hot. I and mean, it's usually they're housed with someone in there. Okay. Um, would you consider tying your security cameras into uh, the Baltimore City uh, City Watch cameras? I would. I I would consider that. Yes. Uh, well, uh, let me ask you: Do you more than consider it? If we made it a condition um, that it be tied in, uh, would you be um, agreeable to that condition? I don't believe it's necessary to that to have that condition because it's like i said the building has served the community it's been a library it has been a church 
Um, I don't see, there's no major report that I've been able to find. Um, I've done extensive research when I looked into uh, the building um, of any crime happening at that building. Um, there are 7-Elevens that are open um, that are pretty much smaller um, and they're chain-like um, organ uh, establishments and they have foot traffic all day. They do have some parking, um, but they do have walk up, more walk up. It's not a requirement for this building um, to actually as a requirement for it to be a, 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 a um, as far as uh, off street parking, they've asked for it to be more of a, to be uh, pedestrian friendly and not to be um, automobile oriented as per code. So it, you know, it not being having parking is actually um, allowing it to meet the requirements. But I don't want to um, make any promises that we would be willing to add uh, have our cameras or network of cameras connected to the Baltimore City Police Department, et cetera, et cetera. There's, I know that Baltimore City um, has a huge um, ground network camera system and, and um, more, I guess, I believe more than any other city in America. Um, so, you know, we have to consider also individual privacy rights as well. Um, we have people coming from the hospital who are visiting their loved ones and, you know, whether or not they want to be surveilled while they make personal um, purchases. But we'll definitely be willing to turn over any um, evidence, video evidence and recordings to, and work with law enforcement you know, uh, officials as required. Okay, well, as long as you understand that as a board, you know, we, we see a number of these situations and projects uh, over time. Um, I mean, I live in Baltimore City too, I'm aware of crime in my area and also in the area of the location which you propose to place the store. Um, and oftentimes, or sometimes, you know, the board may conclude in its experience um, uh, that for safety issues, which is one of the balancing uh, competing interests that must be made and considered, uh, uh, that for the, for the, the greater good, uh, and we're not talking about surveilling anybody walking from the hospital to the premises, but actually on the premises, uh, uh, sometimes it's a help for folks to know that it is uh, at least have access to uh, security cameras and that help on the way that much faster. Uh, we have our but, cameras are all right now are IP cameras, so they're they're able to be accessed from web have have. Um, web access so we they could be viewed remotely and we can also share them share them with users etc um and i respect i respect what you're saying um with regard to ensuring that you know the that um safety is always you know number one consideration and so we don't want we're not here to harm anyone i'm just i'm just bringing up points in uh support of the other side of the thought train of thought Sure, and I, and I want you to be aware of the things that the board often considers in circumstances like this. Miss, it would. Yes, sir. Miss Johnson, what you're saying is, if there is a need and you're approached, you will share the footage, but it's not just going to be on a rolling basis, just streaming it straight to the police department. Correct. Correct. Okay. Any other questions from the board, or any? Uh, no. None for me. None for me. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation and you, we will take this up. Yes, sir. Conclusion of the docket. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, that concludes matter number 2020-196. I believe that concludes oh, the- Sorry, one second. Um, that Miss Cooper message saying that she is available to be unmuted. I'm going to try unmuting her one more time. Right. Try one more time. Uh, hello, Miss Cooper? Okay. <laughs> I will <laughs> instruct her to submit a letter or motion <laughs> under our 10 day reconsideration for technical difficulties. All right. Uh, thank you all. And we'll proceed to the deliberation portion of the, um, the meeting.